Hey everyone, this is the By The Minute Mixed Martial Arts podcast, a little bit of a change for today. Uh, this is the first live video we're going to do for By The Minute Mixed Martial Arts on YouTube. A little bit of a post-fight show here for UFC 208. Last night's Holly Holm, Jermaine Durand, my main event and an underneath. If you're on By The Minute or if you're on iTunes, this will seem like anything but but uh, we will hopefully do a few more of these post shows as we go forward. I'm actually hoping that once we get this a little bit established, we can do it for UFC 209 pretty much as the fights end. So hopefully I will get online. It'll be about 6 a.m. So we'll see how that goes. But yeah, we'll try and do this pretty much as the show as the show ends for pay-per-views. But for today, we're uh, just after 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The show ended about 9 hours ago. So... Let's talk about it. UFC 208, the first pay-per-view of 2017. This, this, in all honesty, was a pretty bad show. Uh, if you're wondering where Nathan Waywell is, by the way, he's sunning himself in Doha, so he's a little bit far away. So, unfortunately, you just get me for today. So, we will start with the prelims and we'll work our way up to the main event. We'll f we'll finish with the main event. There's a lot to talk about with that main event, despite it not being the most exciting fight I've ever seen. So, uh, the first fight was Ryan Lafleur and Ron. Carniero, I thought Flair dominated pretty much all of this fight. I actually gave him a 10 and 8 in the second round. His grappling game was just very, very good. Carniero caught a flying knee with about a minute and a half to go in the third round. Took him down and actually worked him pretty well. I thought that was enough for Carniero to steal the knee found, but uh, I mean, it was obvious that Flair had won the fight. The scores were 30-26. 29-28, 30-27. I actually had 29-27. I gave Carniero round three, but I thought Lafleur won a 10-8 in the second round. So, But Lafleur now 6-1 in UFC. I'm not particularly impressed with his stand-up game, if I'm being completely honest, but when he gets guys to the ground, he looks really good. But he's got to tie up that stand-up game for me if he's going to be a real threat going forward. But in that division, 6-1 and one to start his UFC career. Pretty good start, to be honest. Once we got on a BT Sport or FS1, depending on where you are, we started off with Philippe Novar and Rick Glenn. Thought Novar won the first. I thought his striking game was better, but I was kind of... I'm trying to think how I would put this. I, I thought it was a reasonably close round, but I thought Novar took it. The second and third rounds were just kind of awful to watch, especially if you're a casual fan and you're watching MMA, this is the type of thing that's not great to bring you into the sport because it was that when they were distance Glenn was really really struggling with Nova's stand-up game once we got towards the clinch which Glenn just kind of grabbed for the last two rounds it was one of those things where I gave Glenn round two and three but I felt a little bit dirty doing it because he clinched he, he, he would do just enough and no more to stop the referee splitting it up but this this wasn't exciting, to be honest, but uh, Glenn took a 29-28 on two cards. Nova actually took a 30-27, which I thought was pretty strange, but there you go. Some some judges tend to do that. They actually hate the clinch game and will tend to penalise if you're clinching and doing very little with it. I suppose this is a debate going forward, but we will, we will, we will see how that goes in the future, but... I, I thought Rick Glenn won the fight. He was sporting a grey moustache as well, to be honest. So that 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 gets him a bonus point for, for me. Denis Makachev, this was one-sided as anything. Makachev took him down and just rode him. The thing was, Makachev for me was always wary of Nick Glenn's slippery ground game. So I felt that Makachev was very cautious when he got in the top position. He was very, very cautious about taking full mount. He was going more into three-quarter mount, which is becoming a bit more popular now that people who love leg locks are really able to buck from the bottom and push a guy up in the air and get a leg through for a leg lock. So I th I, I, I'm not going to say that the full mount's going to die out, but certainly when you've got a good grappler and you're on top of a good grappler, guys are being a lot more careful right now. So it will be interesting to see over the next couple of years how much people go into that three-quarter mount where you get into side control, you slide the knee on belly, you come across, but you don't quite just get both knees down on the ground. You're kind of leaving, leaving, the, leaving the leg that went knee on belly just a little bit on top just a little bit on top of the body, not going all the way over. So you're in a good controlling position, but you're not in danger of being bucked upwards and getting the leg of the guy 
on his back through underneath hoping to get a leg lock or a knee bar or something like that so that's going to be really interesting to watch going through going forward with guys like Islam Makachev who was the superior grappler in this fight but was a little bit tentative so um I'm interested to see going forward what's going to happen with as the game evolves. Uh, 30-25, 30-25, 30-27 for Makachev. I actually had 30-26. I think it was the second round I gave a 10 to Makachev, who was just completely dominant. Wilson Heiss and Oka Sasaki. This was actually quite interesting. This was the best fight on the prelims, I felt. Sasaki did a lot of talking in the first round. He was generally just trying to get inside Heiss's head. If you saw it at the start of the fight, in fact, before the fight even started, Heiss was waiting to be introduced. Sasaki was in the blue corner, so he got introduced first. And he just came right to the middle of the cage, just stood in front of Wilson Heiss, talking, shouting, pointing, just trying to get inside his head. And then they showed Heiss when he was being interviewed, and he just and, uh, introduced, sorry, and he just didn't care. So Sasaki was talking a lot he had the six inch reach advantage the six inch height advantage he was a massive flyweight to be honest kind of weird to think that these guys were in the same division when you were watching the fight but his his wrestling game was just so good in this fight to be honest he was taking down he was taking down sasaki at will and he was taking him down from different angles as well he was taking him down straight on but he was also doing that thing when you come straight on but when you don't get the leverage straight away you're turning your hips with it and forcing them against the grain it's it was really good to watch now the, the big mistake that Hayes made i thought he dominated the first 14 minutes of this fight I, I say dominated the first 14 minutes the first sorry two three minutes perhaps sasaki's stand-up game was okay it, it was, it, i suppose it was level but uh, once Hayes started getting the takedowns after two or three minutes he just completely took control Hayes got a takedown towards the end of the third round and when he went for he went for mount and then when sasaki rolled he went to take the back but he did it in such a sloppy way i mean it was one of the worst rounds i've seen in a while when he did that sasaki was able to slip out take, take the back and, and then for, he wasn't really locking a rear naked choke but he was grounding and pounding wilson hayes a lot and it was it was at that point where you were like if he had Three minutes to work with. You could have actually seen a finish there because he got the body triangle in and Hayes was going nowhere. Uh, I had 29-27 Hayes. I had a 10-8 second round where I thought Hayes was just completely dominant. It was 29-28 across the board on the official scorecard. So probably, if you look at the scorecards, probably a little closer than it should have been, but it's still a good win for Hayes. He's one of the few at the top of the flyweight rankings who hasn't had, hasn't ran into the Demetrius Johnson buzzsaw yet. So... Um, he could be next, but we will we will see how that goes. The final prelim, Randy Brown, Bilal Muhammad. This was a case of the first round. Bilal Muhammad leg kicked the shit out of him. I think I think I'm sure it was twenty four leg kicks in the first round, and I don't remember Randy Brown checking any of them or even hinting changes. Stunts. So that was I. I, I Every time, every time I see a guy taking that amount of leg kicks, I always get a little bit concerned. Not just for the fight that's happening right in front of him, but as we go forward. And if you're taking 24 leg kicks in five minutes and you're not checking any of them, it's it's not a good look. We saw in the first fight of the main card, and I actually think Poirier was checking, but we'll get to that. Second round, Bilal Muhammad's wrestling game took over. This was... Pre, pre, pretty impressive from Bilal. He's exciting in fights in UFC, but he was 1-2 and two coming into this fight. Brown was 3-1 and one in UFC after getting through Dana White's looking for a fight. So um, this, was, this was a big win for Bilal. I think it was about 20 seconds to go. Randy Brown in the grappling game finally got in the top position. He went a bit crazy trying to get a ground and pound finish. Nothing really landed, to be honest. Let me just check the official scores. Uh, I actually don't have them in front of me. Hold on. Uh, the official scores for this fight. I had, I think I had 30-27 Muhammad. I can't even remember, but uh, let's see. 30-27, 30-27, 29-28 was the official score. So good win for Bilal Muhammad. And he's he still looks a little green to me, to be honest, despite the fact that he's reasonably experienced. I, I find that quite surprising when I watch him, that he looks a wee bit green. But this was... For me, his best performance in UFC. So we will see going forward what he has. So the main card, 
open up with Jim Miller and Dustin Poirier. First things first, the official scores of this fight. 29-28 Poirier, that's what I had. 30-27 Poirier, you could argue that. 28-28 draw, I have no idea how this was a draw. Poirier was completely dominant in the first two rounds. I thought the first round was a clear 10-9. I thought the second round was a clear 10-9. You could argue a 10-8 for Poirier, but I felt that Miller did enough work in his stand-up game, to be honest, that I thought he did enough to avoid a 10-8 a round. I always feel if you're given 10-8 rounds in rounds that are pure stand-up, it's got to be really, really one-sided. And while Poirier looked really impressive, I... I thought Miller did enough to lose uh, to. I, I thought he did far too much to actually lose a ten eight. So I thought that was kind of harsh. Third round, I thought Miller came back well, looked pretty good, um, and right at the start of the round, which was interesting, Miller had been throwing leg kicks, not with the same ferocity as Bilal Muhammad, but he'd been throwing them during the fight, and then he threw one right at the start of the third round. Poirier buckled. Then he threw another. Uh, then he threw a second one. Poirier wobbled. I think he put one hand on the mat, and then the third one, the Poirier fell down, and it was clear that Poirier was done standing. And if Miller had been a wee bit smarter, he should have just completely disengaged and uh, had a stand-up fight. Now, he didn't have much choice at first because Poirier immediately shot for a takedown when he got back to his feet and actually got it and kept Miller down for a while. After the, after the ground exchange, Miller stood up, to get out of the ground exchange and actually got dominant position in the clinch. I think there was about, there was between a minute and a minute and a half to go. And I felt that that was the point where Miller has to push him against the cage, disengage and invite him to come forward. But Miller kind of got in that sort of one track mind where he just kept shooting for the takedown. And he was so committed to the takedown that I think he actually forgot that if I stand with Poirier, he can do nothing. His lead leg was chewed to bits. I mean, you never see Poirier changing stances, and he did for a second before the takedown. So I, th I thought that was a, a, a miscalculation by Miller. But what can you do? The 28-28 the, the score for me, I, I think the only way you can do it, I haven't seen the official scorecard, but I think the only way you can do it is to give the first round to Miller, the third round to Miller, and 10-8 for Poirier in the second. But... I can't make a case for Miller in the first round. And I can make the case for a 10-8 in the second, but I thought it would have been really harsh on Miller. So the 28-28 scorecard was pretty shambolic, to be honest. But Poirier looked interesting with hair. I actually, I think I said on the feed, he looked a bit like CM Punk if he had a shower and a shave. I don't mean that in a fighting way, obviously, but it was so weird to see Poirier have hair. Uh, so Glover Teixeira and Jared Cannonier. This was a really boring fight. This was, I, I said something about this being what you would call in a lot of sports a professional performance by Glover Teixeira. He took down Makhachev over and over. He lay on top of him. He, again, was a little bit tentative. The thing of Cannonier that I found quite interesting in his last few fights, Cannonier had a fight in December. I can't remember if it was on the tough finale or if it was on that Albany card. I actually can't remember. But he had a fight with Ion Kutalaba, which was a fabulous fight. Uh, but Kutalaba kept taking Cannonier down. And it was interesting because Cannonier was... Cannonier looked like he was well-rounded in pretty much everything. Like, his, his bottom game was good. But his takedown defense was really, really suspect in that fight. And when he got matched up with Glover, I thought, the chances of an upset in this fight are really unlikely unless Cannonier can stand early and land something. But And, and you actually saw early in the fight, when Cannonier was circling, his feet were good and his head movement was good. And I thought, his stand-up game looks pretty good, but it was pretty much every time Glover shot. I mean, he was just taking him down and he was making it look really easy as well. Glover, Glover needed that, to be honest, after he'd been on a good run. And then he ran into Anthony Johnson's uppercut. I actually think I said on the podcast that um, I think I said something like Glover was looking really good until Anthony Johnson uppercutted him. And I think saying that, that would kind of sound like I said that uh, Glover was looking good in that fight. But that fight was 13 seconds. I meant the few fights before that. Um, I th I'm trying to remember what the scores were. I think it was 30-26 across the board. That was certainly what I scored it. Um, but... I mean, there wasn't much to this fight. Glover's ranked number three in the light heavyweight division, and we actually need to talk about the light heavyweight division going forward. This is 
we, there was a report that came out, I think it was yesterday afternoon, it may have been Friday, that Misha Serkinov is not going to have his contract renewed. Now, Misha Serkinov has had four fights in UFC. He's had four wins. I think he's had three finishes, and he's looked great doing it. It sounds to me, if, if the reports are true, it sounds to me that Misha's asked for too much money and Dana's just chased him, which... I this is this again this is a long convoluted argument when we go back to like fighters associations and that because I mean fighters are underpaid there's no denying it you can also make the argument that even if you get towards like a Conor McGregor or a Ronda Rousey or something like that even they're underpaid but when you come down to the bottom and you come down to probably 90% of the roster they are so badly underpaid and when you look at the light heavyweight division right now Ryan Bader and Misha Serkinov are absolute top 10 light heavyweights. Now, it looks like we're going to see... I mean, we're definitely going to see Ryan Bader going to Bellator, and we're going to see Misha Serkinov hit free agency. And in a thin division, that is a kind of bad look for UFC, because I remember when Daniel Cormier pulled out of the UFC 206 main event, with the injury, we were looking. My first instinct was to look at who Johnson was going to face in an interim like heavyweight title shot, and I, th I think Johnson was ranked number one among the contenders, and then it was like two, three, four, and five were Bader, Gustafson. I can't, I can't remember the other two, but basically it was guys who in the last two years Johnson had smoked, and it was like you can't really justify these guys coming back. And then the further you look down the rankings to try and figure out somebody who Johnson hadn't marked already, I think you got to, to number eight and it was Shogun Hua. And I just thought, this isn't great, to be honest. Uh, especially when you look at Ovin St. Prue's performance last week. I haven't seen the fight yet, but apparently he was poor. And I think he's ranked number six or seven in the light heavyweight. So that's a, that's a thin division and you can't afford to be losing guys like Serkinov. So, yeah, I'm... I'm 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 a I'm a little disappointed about the fact that UFC aren't going to re-sign Misha Serkinov by the looks of it. Glover, he said in his post-fight interview that he needs to go up a level to compete with Cormier and Jones, and he's definitely right because uh, Glover's one of those guys that like he's definitely the second tier of light heavyweights, and that's not in any way a dig at him because he's. He's a really, really good fighter in a really, really thin division where he's he's well above your guys that are ranked like six down, like your Ovin St. Prue's, like obviously uh, Jared Cannonier and stuff like that. But he is almost certainly going to lose every time to Daniel Cormier. It was his it was his wrestling that won today, and he's not as good a wrestler as Cormier. His stand up's nowhere near John Jones's. I mean, John Jones. <laughs> it's going to depend what John Jones comes back from suspension, but um, I. I, I needs to add something to his game, I think, if he's ever going to be a title challenger. But that division is so thin that he's probably one, one win away from actually challenging for the title. We're going to get the Cormier-Johnson rematch finally. And I assume the winner of that is going to defend against John Jones. Now, if Cormier beats Rumble again, you can't really do Rumble-Glover 2 because Rumble knocked him out in 13 seconds. So there is a possibility that Glover could be like one win away from a title shot and... That's that's all well and good, but the level he's at at the moment, he's not going to challenge whoever the champion is, whether it's Cormier, Rumble, or John Jones. So, moving on, middleweights, Ronaldo Souza, Jack Ray, he defeated Tim Bosch pretty easily, to be honest. This was the only finish on the card. Now, I, I don't want to judge a card on finishes compared to decisions telling you how good a, fight, I have, a card was, because I've seen, I've seen cards where there's been hardly any finishes that have been great cards. This was the only finish on the card. Uh, Jack and A looked fabulous, to be honest. I, I saw a lot of people online saying were surprised that Jack and A looks back to his best. Not surprised, but it was just like Jack and A's back to his best. And I'm like, when when was he ever not like this? I thought he won the Yol Romero fight. I thought he destroyed Vitor Belfort. I don't feel like Jack and A ever slipped, to be honest. I thought he was great. So, uh, three, one of the first round, a brutal Kimura on Tim Bosch. Bosch looked great at UFC 205, and I wondered if he was going to have a little bit of a career renaissance. But, um, this 
well, there's a, a bit of a setback, but it's it's a strange one. I always wonder with that because like Bosch Bosch beats Rafael Natal and, and he, take a career right now. It's kind of, I mean, it's one of those he beats Jackies right in the title picture, but. When you've had your best performance in years, you want to build on that. You just you don't just want to throw yourself to the wolves, and that's what I kind of feel happened here. Uh, Jackery for me must must get the winner of the Bisping Romero fight if that's what's going to happen. He mu- he must. But that division is so interesting that it's it's hard to tell because I mean Bisping's going for surgery by the sounds of it, so his fight with Yoel Romero might get delayed a little. You've got Chris Weidman and Gegard Musasi at UFC 210. I think that's in Buffalo, actually, so they're really hitting the New York market with pay-per-views. There's there's so much there's so much fluidity at the top of the middleweight division. It's a great division. When you even look at, like, Robert Whitaker, Derek Brunson, um, it's... Christoph Yotko as well. That's a that's a good division. But when you look at the top tier, Rockhold if he ever comes back, I don't know what's happening with Rockhold. Weidman if he gets a win, just for who he is, will be straight back in the picture. Musasi if he wins, he's well overdue a title shot. Jackery's well overdue a ch- title shot. Romero's probably getting his title shot, and even he's a little overdue. So uh, certainly a queue of murderers for Michael Bisping coming up. Jackery just great, great last night. Really impressed. Another middleweight who might be back in the picture is Anderson Silva. Now, I thought Derek Brunson won this fight 30-27, if I'm being completely honest. I thought, I thought at the time, I thought you could make an argument for 29-28 Silva. I thought Brunson clearly won round one. I thought two and three were reasonably close, but it was... I mean, I still thought Brunson did more than enough to win those fights. Um, Silva really didn't do much. He got outstruck. I think the the best success Silva had was stuffing takedowns. And I'm under the impression with scoring, stuffing takedowns is not so much about scoring points in stuffing takedowns. It's more just opponent from scoring points. But every Brunson was scoring his takedowns. I still felt that he was doing better clinch work. I thought the stand-up was reasonably even, but I thought Brunson had a slight edge. And then in the second and third round, Brunson did get a takedown and did some decent work from there. I mean, it wasn't an exciting fight to watch, but I I genuinely thought 30-27 Anderson was a disgrace of a scorecard. 29-28, I was still a little bit perplexed. And when they're reading out the scores and they go 29-28, 29-28, and 30-27 for the winner by unanimous decision, as soon as I heard 30-27, I was like, well, Brunson's won the fight. And it actually ruined my bet, to be honest, because I had uh, I had a couple of bets on last night. I don't normally uh, bet, but I, I like Jim Miller's price, so I took him. Obviously, that didn't come in. And then I put a double on Brunson and Jermaine Durandamy, so that, that judging ruined it for me. Uh, when you look to the total strikes, I think, I think Brunson landed double the strikes. He was something like 2 for 10 on takedowns, which isn't great. Um, he controlled clinch position so much more. I, I, I thought this was a a disgrace of a score, to be honest, and not because I had a bet on it. But, uh, yeah, I, f- I feel for Brunson. He'd been on a great run. He lost to Robert Whitaker in a fight he probably should have won. And then, I- when I say he should have won that one, I-, I-, I thought he should have beat Robert Whitaker, but Whitaker knocked him out. This time, I thought he got robbed by the judges. Again, if you'd, if you'd gone to 29-28 for Silva, I'd have been like, that's a poor score, but I'll take it. I'm going to have a look at MMADecisions.com to see the media scores to see how people scored that. I've got it open at the moment. So we had one, two, three, four. Called it for Silva, 29-28. No one had a 30-27. 29-28 Brunson. We had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 9, 10. We had a, 20, a 30-28 Brunson. So obviously someone scored a 10-10. And we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cards that scored 30-27 Brunson. So... Uh, Looking at the fan scoring, just under 40% had Brunson winning 30-27. 25% had Brunson winning 29-28. We had 21% of the fans thinking Silva won 29-28. We had 6% thinking Silva won 30-27. That's just unacceptable. And Silva draw 2.6%. So um, 
just looking at the round by round breakdowns on the fan scoring as well. Brunson, sixty nine percent of fans thought Brunson won the first round. I can't see how it's that low. F- just over half think Brunson won the second round. I thought that was the closest round, to be honest. Third round, 79.3% thought Brunson won. I'm actually surprised more people thought Brunson won the third than the first. I thought the first was the clearest one. But either way, uh, a pretty shambolic scorecard. Um, and yeah. So, is Anderson back in the title picture? I guess we'll, I guess we'll see. He's going to need a more convincing win than that. But because he's Anderson Silva, because him and Michael Bisping had that really close fight in London last year, Dana might go crazy. And might just say, you know what? We're going to give Anderson a title shot. We're going to give him the winner of UL Romero and Michael Bisping. I think he'd be more likely to do that if Bisping actually beat Romero. So think about doing that rematch. But it's it's hard, it's hard to tell what goes through Dana's head, especially when I love the story of Dan Henderson's title shot. And obviously I loved it was in Manchester. I was able to go to it. It was fantastic. But Dan Henderson at the time really wasn't deserving. So, um, yeah. It'll be interesting to see if Bisping beats Romero, if he'll get another, what I think a lot of people would see as a pretty undeserving title shot. Main event. Main event. Holly Holm and Jermaine Durand to me. This, this was interesting. I'm going to have to bring up the, the media scores for this one. This was a really, 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 really close fight. I thought that Jermaine clearly won round one, and I thought Holly clearly won round five. So, so everything was pretty close. I scored and I actually can't remember uh, which rounds I gave to Holly but I scored it 3-2 three, three, for Holly I had 48-47 the interesting thing was that at the end of the second round Jermaine landed a really hard right hand that was pretty fragrantly after the bell she landed a, a straight l- I'm just punching the mic here. she landed a left just after the buzzer went and she didn't stop and followed up with a right hook and, I mean, clocked Holly and Holly wobbled a little bit. Now, when Holly wobbles a little bit on a shot that far after the bell, then the referee's got to, at the very least, give a warning. Um, you can you can say heat of the moment, you can say it's a title fight, so you can say, you know what, it's just a warning, we're not going to take a point off initially. Now, at the end of the third round, Jermaine did it again. It wasn't nearly as flagrant. It wasn't as bad, but you've still got to do something about that. You still can't have a situation where there's such a flagrant shot after the second round bell that everybody's going, whoa, this is, this is, the, the, this is so flagrant. And then have something similar happen at the end of the very next round. So the referee frog marches Jermaine back to a corner and only gives her a warning. And I think, I think everybody's in agreement that that should have been one point off. And that would have completed the shambles of shambles because... <laughs> If 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 they had taken a point off of Jermaine Durandamy, then this fight would have been a draw. It would have been a unanimous draw. And I mean, draws in title fights, it's it wouldn't be the first time. I mean, obviously we saw it with Wonderboy and Woodley a few months ago, which we're seeing the rematch next month. But when it's a vacant title, when it's a brand new title, and you've had the kind of tumultuous build up that this uh, belt has had, then that would have been a really, really bad look. But it still would have been the right decision in my eyes. If the judges are going to score 48, 47 Durand to me, which they did across the board. And I, I can kind of, from the from the eye-pleasing point of view, I can kind of see that because, I mean, Holly kind of abandoned her stand-up game because for the first four rounds, Jermaine looked better when they were standing and exchanging. It wasn't until the fifth round where Jermaine looked tired that Holly's stand-up game really came in to effect. So I, 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 I suppose I can argue. I, can, I suppose I can argue that um, Jermaine does win this fight, and Jermaine certainly tried to put on a more crowd-pleasing fight. But just scoring it myself, I had 48-47 home. I would have had 48-46 home if the referee had done his job properly. So uh, just looking at the official scores... Sal D'Amato gave the first three to Jermaine and the last two to Holly. Uh, Chris Lee gave one, three, and four to Jermaine. Jeff Mullen gave one, two, and three. So Jeff Mullen had the same scorecard as Sal D'Amato. One, two, and three for Jermaine. Media scores, 49-46 Jermaine, 49-47 Jermaine, one each. For Jermaine, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 48-47s. For Holly, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve. 
a uh, 12, 40, 47. We had a 40, 45, which is a bit of a weird um, score from Jed Meshu as well, who I like. I find that a weird score. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think most people felt that Holly won the fight. I think most people certainly felt that um, that Jermaine should have, been, should have had a point taken off. So, I don't know what's going to happen going forward for this division. I'm actually a big advocate of this division, but UFC has certainly missed a trick. Um, what they've got to do is they've got to aggressively pursue some of the Bellator girls. Now, I know the Bellator ironclad backs, but I mean, these girls are going to come up at some point, and UFC have got to be on top of it if they want to make this division anything resembling a success. Bellator have kind of countered this by having their own uh, featherweight title coming up soon. I think it's... Uh, it's Julia Budd and Marlis Kunin who are going to be fighting at the start for the inaugural Bellator women's featherweight title. There's a couple of others there. Invictus, Invictus featherweights, it's hard because Cindy Dandwa has been a little bit overlooked, but, I mean, the opinion's a bit split on Cindy. Um, Charmaine Tweet is good, but she's 39, so I can't see UFC pursuing her. UFC have got to sign Megan Anderson. She's 26. She's a pure featherweight. She's got to be signed. It's It just has to happen. Now, the argument about Chris Cyborg, I, I, I didn't know this, but it was said yesterday. I mean, Cyborg was in the front row, and I thought that's kind of strange when she's about to go on drug suspension. Now, UFC and Cyborg's team have applied for a retrospective TUE, a therapeutic, a therapeutic usage exemption. And uh, I... I, it has worked in the past for some fighters, but I I don't see I don't see how they can justify this one. I I wait, that's a lie. I can see how they can justify this one, but I don't see how um, Cyborg is going to pass the eye test. I know it's really harsh to talk like that, but um, I mean Cyborg did fail for steroids in 2011. She failed for the diuretic. I mean, she needed the diuretic after these horrible weight cuts. But the argument for me is that I don't want to see Cyborg fighting at 145. Cyborg's doctor said she shouldn't be fighting below 165. You know fighters are daft, so, I mean, realistically, 155 maybe. But getting to 145, I'm really worried that Cyborg is going to really do... uh, She has already done damage herself with these weight cuts let's let's not be around the bush and i really don't want to see a situation i mean ufc's got dangerously close a couple of times to something really awful happening in a weight cut cyborg to me does one of the worst weight cuts in the entire sport and i i don't want to see anything bad happen to her so i mean i I feel like i feel like i'm giving an oxfam plea here but just be sensible be sensible i don't i mean this are we we remember the arguments about Cyborg fighting at Bantamweight. They were ridiculous as they were. Now, Cyborg doesn't help herself by... I mean, she seems to be obsessed with putting on as much mass as possible, which makes the the weight cut even harder. But just just look after this girl, because she nearly killed herself cutting to 141 twice. And every, and But I, I keep hearing the argument that this, that's like, if she can get to 145, eh, 141, she can get to 145, no bother. And, I mean, she got to 145... A lot of times, it's been a while since she missed weight, but just because she got there doesn't mean it's any good for her. So, just be careful going forward. I'm I'm really concerned about this, and I I I'm not going to play. I told you so. If something bad happens, but I really don't want to look back on this and think we all we all we all knew that this was a possibility. We all knew that something bad could happen here. So, be careful. Uh, and t- going back to. Jermaine Durand, she said in her post-fight interview that she needs surgery on her hand because she has torn ligaments after the fight with Larissa Pacheco. That fight was like two years ago, so I don't know what's happening here. So, um, The featherweight division in UFC certainly hasn't got off to a good start. There's there's a lot of moving parts, but I'm, I'm, interested, to see what ha- I'm interested to see what happens with Cyborg. I'm very interested to see what happens with Megan Anderson. If UFC don't sign her in the next month, then they are not taking this division seriously. So, I, 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 I don't know what to say. But, um, and like I say, like I said a couple of minutes ago with Bellator, they've got to really look at those featherweights and really keep an eye on when their contracts are coming up because if they want this division to be anything resembling a success, they're going to have to sign some bodies. And I think that 
I mean, I mean, I say this on I say this on every podcast. UFC needs a flyweight division at one twenty five for the women. There's talent out there. There's strawweights that should be fighting at flyweight. There's bantamweights that should be fighting at flyweight. There's talent coming through at strawweight and bantamweight to bring up the shortfall. It's just something that needs to happen. So, um, I don't, don't want to keep ranting about it on every single podcast I do. If you're watching on YouTube and this is the first time, if you go back and listen to the podcast, you'll be fucking sick of it. So, uh, yeah. I I think we'll wrap up just now before I go on a 125 rant. Uh, three weeks time, we've got UFC 209. Wonderboy Thompson against Tyron Woodley in the rematch for Tyron Woodley's welterweight title. Interim lightweight championship, we have Habib Nurmagomedov and Tony Ferguson. This is actually a really good card. Mark Hunt and Alistair Overeem. Uh, for us Scots, we've got Paul Craig against Tyson Pedro on the main card, on the undercard, sorry. So good luck to Paul Craig. Next week for Welsh fans, Jack Marshman's fighting in Halifax, Nova Scotia. The main event is Derek Lewis and Travis Brown. It's going to be interesting to see what Travis Brown can do after leaving Edmund's team. So it would be very funny if Travis is just back to his best now that he's got away from Coach Edmund. But we'll see what happens next week. So uh, if you enjoyed, uh, please subscribe below. If you want to get involved, we will hopefully do a live video for UFC 209 pretty much after the show. So um, hopefully it can be a wee bit interactive. Buy the minute.co for UFC and coverage. Thanks for watching. Uh, thanks for listening. And I'll talk to you again sometime.